Hello, and welcome to your CNET Tool 4 Week 2 video. Uh, this week we're going to look at an introduction to Linux, uh, which we're going to use next week to create an Apache web server in AWS. So you kind of need to learn, know Linux a little bit. Uh, so we're going to look at what Linux is, uh, you know, what the purpose of an operating system is, and where Linux came from and its features, and then how to use it, uh, how to issue commands, get uh, uh, help, command line editing, uh, directories, uh, directory structures, file naming rules, uh, and text editors, uh, what they're used for in, in Nano and Vim, two popular command line text editors. Uh, always available in Linux. Uh, so, operating systems perform two major tasks. They manage uh, the resources to give you a platform to run applications on, and they give uh, an interface or provide an interface that allows uh, the operating system to communicate with you, the end user. Now, over time, operating systems have evolved from a command line interface to a menu uh, driven interface and then finally a full-fledged uh, GUI or graphical user interface. And depending on the operation uh, operating system installation and setup, modern operating systems can provide all of these to accommodate your preferences. Now servers, as we're going to learn in a little while, are generally command line only and in fact that's what you're going to be using when you connect to your AWS instances as you did last week, right? You you did this already. You saw the, the command line interface. You just didn't really know what to do other than log out. We're going to learn what to do this week. Uh, now, to understand Linux, we have to talk about Unix first, because that's what came first. Uh, Unix was not the first operating system, but it's been around since the 70s. It made a huge impact, uh, and it's still quite popular today mainly through its uh, derivatives uh, Linux. Uh, now Unix was developed in the early 70s by Ken Thompson. Uh, he wanted to play a, a crude network strategy game called Space Travel. And the operating system that existed at the time, Multics, uh, didn't allow the game to run very well. In fact, it crashed the system. So he wrote Unix to play a game. So anyone who has ever told you that computers don't exist for gaming, they were wrong. Because <laughs> it totally does. Uh, without gaming, we would not have uh, Unix, we would not have modern operating systems that all in some way uh, derive from Unix in one way or another. Uh, Linux, Mac OS, Cisco's iOS, all Unix-based operating systems. Uh, so Unix was developed at AT&T Bell Labs. It took the company a few years to realize that they could make some money off and it would be pretty popular. Uh, and they did that. They marketed a proprietary version that became uh, System V Release 4. And then Ken Thompson took a break from working in industry and went to work in another industry, education, uh, and was teaching at UC Berkeley for a while. And there he provided students the source code and the shell or the interface and that branched into a free version of the operating system that became BSD, uh, Berkeley Software Distribution Unix. Uh, so Unix was developed to incorporate the following features. It allows for multiple users uh, by assigning each user a slice of time on the system to give them the illusion that the system is paying entire, uh, complete attention to them. It allows for multitasking. Uh, you can execute one or more tasks uh, at the same time, three different time slices. It supports multiprocessing, uh, which allows tasks to be formed on multiple processors, as all modern operating systems too, right? But you got to keep in mind this was the 1970s. Uh, computers were the size of a house. Uh, and it has a, a simplified uh, mechanism for sharing data and programs amongst the users through file permissions that we're not actually going to look at in this course, but it's really cool how they did that. Uh, 
Unix also evolved at the same time as ARPANET, which was the predecessor to the Internet, and that made it pretty easy to set up computer networks and use networking, uh, and eventually Internet-related utilities. Now we're going to talk about ARPANET and the Internet a little bit later in the semester. Not super duper in depth, but uh, given that this is an introduction to web development course, you kind of need to know how the Internet works and where it came from. And Unix uh, played a very, very big role in its development. Uh, another important person in the, the history of Unix and Linux is Richard Stallman, uh, who published the New Manifesto in 1984, uh, which is actually a backronym that stands for Not Unix. Uh, this described the need for free software. Free is in the sense of free speech, not free beer. Uh, and it resulted in the New Project, which developed free open source replacements for pretty much every uh, program in Unix, uh, but not the kernel itself, which is the part of the operating system that interacts with the, the OS and the hardware. All of those programs were released under the new general public license, which permits anyone to copy, use, or modify the software as long as the rights are preserved for anyone receiving subsequent copies. Uh, and under the new project, there were many free avail uh, utilities available to make a Unix-like operating system. Uh, but uh, the Unix-like operating system for PCs uh, that Richard was developing, it wasn't, wasn't stable. Uh, and eventually one came along uh, and that, that became Linux. That, that just straight up became Linux. And that took a few years more. Uh, 1991, Linus Torvalds, a Finnish computer programming student, released the Linux kernel and even placed it under the, the new general public license. So the Linux kernel plus the new software uh, uh, and some other components were all combined into a powerful Unix-like system. Uh, it can't technically be called Unix because it's never been certified, but everyone in industry regards it as such. Uh, in fact, you usually see uh, Unix slash Linux, as you've seen in the slides here, or sometimes just star NIX. Uh, in reference to both, because they both work pretty much the same. Uh, the operating system that was born out of this uh, is technically called new slash Linux, but most people just call it Linux, uh, and that kind of kind of underplays the uh, the role Richard Stallman had, because uh, he had a huge uh, huge uh, contribution through the new project, and. Uh, Dropping the new from that really, really uh, underplays or downplays his, his role. Uh, so fast forward to today, there's, there's many, many different distributions or versions of Linux. Uh, we usually call them distributions or distros. Some of them have specialized uses. Some of them are more general purpose operating systems. And Linux is everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere. Uh, it powers websites we access. Uh, it powers the cloud. Mobile devices. Uh, mobile devices use uh, uh, Android, for example. Android smartphones and tablets are powered by the Android operating system, which is based on a modified version of the Linux kernel. Uh, and in cloud computing, it's huge, too. It's huge in the cloud. Uh, fun joke, or a funny joke that uh, exemplifies this kid and his dad are talking and the, the father, or the dad says to the father, uh, Daddy, what are clouds made of? And the dad replies with, Linux servers mostly. And it's true. It's true. It's everywhere. And you don't even know it. Well, you do now, but you didn't. Now, all of these different distributions that exist today can be traced to a few base parent distributions, or families. Uh, which we'll look at a little more in depth on the next slide. Uh, but these generally fall into Ubuntu Debian based systems. We're actually going to be using Ubuntu. Uh, Arch, Red Hat, uh, Fedora, Mandriva are all kind of one family. Slackware, Gentoo, and then there's a bunch of distributions that kind of exist independently of these, or maybe they're hybrids of some of these 
uh, as we'll see. And the best depiction I've seen of these is on the, uh, the periodic table of Linux distributions uh, that I got off DistroWatch, uh, distrowatch.com. If you're curious, go check them out. Uh, they have information about all the different Linux distributions. Uh, and this is really cool. It's color-coded. Anything in yellow is a Debian Ubuntu variant. So as you can see, it's very, very popular. Right? That's, that's the most popular one as far as in terms of number of distros. Uh, the blue over here are Arch Linux based uh, variants. Uh, the red here are Red Hat Fedora uh, based distributions. These are all Slackware based. These ones are all Gentoo based. And then the pink across the bottom uh, are the, uh, the other ones that don't necessarily fit into one major uh, family. They may, may fit into a couple different ones. But I uh, thought it was a cool way to exemplify all of that. Uh, now you can access, and we actually looked at this slide last week, I believe. You can access uh, Linux from any command line using Windows 10 or 11 or Mac OS, uh, or even Linux itself, uh, by using the SSH command. Just SSH, new username, at IP address or fully qualified domain name and you get in. It's the same command line across all distributions or all different all operating systems. Uh, all Linux commands follow a particular structure. They have the command and then various arguments uh, in sequence. Now some commands can be issued without arguments like pwd, date, ls, cal. We're going to learn about some of these a little later. Uh, but some Linux commands can be issued with arguments as well. And arguments are simply uh, path names, text, or an option that modifies the behavior of the command. It gives you the output in a slightly different way, or it gives you slightly more specialized output. Uh, some examples of this are the ls command, which is used to list file names in the current directory. And on its own, that's what it does. ls will give you a directory listing of your current directory. But you can provide the argument of another directory, and it will give you a file listing of that directory. So ls slash bin would do exactly that. Or you could uh, you give pass it the dash l option, ls dash l, and that will give you a detailed listing or a long listing uh, of the file names in the current directory. And you could even combine these. You could get a, a ls dash l slash bin will give you a detailed listing of the files in the bin directory. Isn't that pretty cool? Now, Linux has over 2,500 uh, commands and utilities, and I'm actually not sure what the number is, but it's a lot. I don't expect you to memorize them all in this course. In fact, we're going we're gonna to talk about a handful of them in this course, because this isn't a Linux course, this is a web design course but you need just enough Linux to be able to uh, install and configure an Apache server in Linux in AWS. Uh, so we need to talk about some stuff, right? But I don't expect you to memorize every command. No one should. I haven't memorized every command and every option for every command, and I've been using Linux for a good long time. Uh, a good user or Linux uh, system administrator or sysadmin will learn how to use commands on the fly. And one handy utility for this is the man command, uh, or manual. That's what man stands for. And this provides you information about how to use a command. It'll give you usage, uh, samples, arguments, options, examples. Commands are classified into sections or volumes. And all you have to do to look at the man page for a command is just type man and give it the argument of the command that you want to look at. So for example, man ls will show you the man page for the ls command. These are even available on the internet, so you can access them through a web browser if you want, but they're just straight up available to you from the command line, which you're always going to have access to if you're on a Linux system. Now, if you don't know the name of a Linux command, but you can think of something you want to do, you can actually use the k option with the man utility to search commands that match a particular pattern. Uh, so man-k copy will 
display all of the commands that have the word copy in them. This could be a useful thing. Uh, once you're within those man pages, you can navigate uh, through them using some shortcut keys, which is pretty useful. Uh, you can go down one line at a time with the Enter key. The spacebar will take you a full screen down. Control B will take you a full screen up. And you can even search for patterns in there uh, with the slash and then type the string of characters you want to look for, usually a word or something. Uh, and you can jump to, or it will allow you to jump to where that exists within the man page, which is pretty handy. Like using uh, Control and F and searching on a web page. Exact same functionality. And once you found the information you, you need, you want to get out of there, right? So you just push Q for quit. And you're done. You're out. Uh, now, we're going to look at a whole bunch of these. It says your instructor will demonstrate. We're going to look at these in the next lecture video where I, I go through the tutorial with you. Uh, a bunch of these commands. Uh, but here's a bunch of the, uh, the common ones you're going to use to get some practice with. Um, PWD uh, will display your current working directory. It actually stands for print working directory. Uh, most Linux commands work that way. The, the command is short for what it does. So if you know what it's short for, it's pretty easy to remember the syntax. CD is short for change directory. Uh, and you can provide that the, the optional argument of a directory or path name that you want it to change into or move you to. Uh, ls, short for list, and it lists files of a directory. And there's a whole bunch of options for ls, like dash l, which will give you a detailed listing, dash a, which will show hidden files, dash uppercase r, which will give you a recursive li uh, listing. So it will show if there's subdirectories in your directory, it will show the contents of those as well. Uh, dash D will just list directories. All kinds of useful stuff. Cal is a handy one. Uh, you can provide it the month and the year and it will display the calendar uh, for that that particular time. Uh, date gives you the date and time. which could be a useful thing when you're learning to script things. We're not touching on that in this course, but that's commonly when you tend to use that or when you're trying to automate something and you need a date and timestamp of when something happened. Who lists all the users that are logged into the server? Uh, in your particular case, since you're using your Ubuntu server in AWS, there's not going to be anybody else logged in, right? Just you. But uh, normally you'd be on a, a live Linux system with many users logged in. Who am I will display the, the username of the user that's logged in, and this can be a particularly handy thing sometimes. Clear is one I tend to use all the time, and that clears the screen. Uh, and then finally, uh, PASSWD, that changes the user's password. And if you use it in conjunction with the username, uh, and you have administ uh, administrative privileges, you can change other users' passwords with this. It's a handy thing. Uh, once you're on the command line, you're going to find, you know, you're going to make mistakes, right? Uh, I make typos all the time. Uh, and there's shortcuts to get around things. A good, good sysadmin will, will learn these as they go and become more productive as a result. We're only going to focus on a few of these. And I, again, I don't expect you to master these in a week, but there's a reference for them here and within the, uh, the lab. We're going to teach you some basic Linux skills. And you're going to be using uh, your Ubuntu instance, uh, not this particular one, but the one we spin up next week, your web server. You're going to be using that all semester to build a website on. So you need to work productively in a Linux environment. Control L will clear the screen. Control U will clear that particular command line. You can scroll through your command history with the up and down arrow in the appropriate direction. So the up arrow will take you up, the down arrow will take you down. Usually use that one if you've gone back too far. Uh, backspace, or sometimes Control Backspace or Control H, will delete the, uh, the character before the cursor. Control W will delete the word before the cursor. Control A will take you to the beginning of the line. Control E will take you to the end of the line. And you can move forward and backwards one word with Alt F for forward and Alt B for backwards. 
or if you're on a Mac, you need Option plus the right or left arrow appropriately. Hopefully that makes sense too far. I know I'm going through this pretty quick, but it is a video, so if you feel need, pause at any time. Uh, so, to, uh, to organize your files within any system, you should have a, a directory structure, some kind of common directory structure. Uh, and if you're, you have many, many, many files, you might even have subdirectories. Now, Linux was, the, the whole file system was designed with files, particular files being stored in particular directories. And learning how to issue commands to navigate and manipulate the directories and files within the file system, that's an essential skill for users and administrators. And you're going to have to do this. So you need to know how it works. And you're going to need to know how to do it, which is why we looked at all this stuff leading up to this. Uh, Everything in Linux descends from root, or slash. It's represented by a slash. And that's the beginning directory. It's the parent directory, the ancestor directory, to all directories in the file system. Every other directory is a child directory, or a grandchild directory, and so on and so forth. Uh, and These can be created as required. Some of these already exist in the file system, as you're going to see. Uh, and the, uh, the directory itself represents an upside-down tree. And there's actually a command called tree uh, in Linux that allows you to do this. Now, it's not installed by default in Ubuntu, but we can install it, and you're totally going to in this week's lab. Uh, so path names are an important thing to understand in Linux and how they work. Uh, path names are used to specify the location of a file within the file system. Uh, and these are used in web design too, as we're going to see when we start building our website. Understanding how these work is the same way. Uh, path names point to a file system location by following the directory tree <coughs> expressed in a string of characters, uh, with each component separated by a de delimiting character generally a slash. Uh, they descend from root, as we just learned, right? Everything descends from root. So for example, uh, home Ubuntu, right? You see the slash in front? Well, we know that slash is root. That's, that's a directory. Within that directory, there's the home directory. And within that, there's the Ubuntu directory. Now, I use this one specifically because in your AWS instance that we spun up last week that we're using this week uh, that's the default user that you get you get the a user with the username Ubuntu and they have a home directory and that's that's where it exists it exists within the, the slash uh, home subdirectory of root uh, there's a whole bunch of common directories and it's actually really cool some of the the history behind where these names originated or why they originated. Uh, but root, or slash, that's the root directory, and it's, as I've mentioned, the ancestor to all directories. Slash home, pretty self-explanatory. It's, it's used to store users' home directories, so every single user on the system will have a directory within there. Uh, home username, that's a specific user's home directory, in this case username, or on the previous slide, Ubuntu which is what we're going to have in, uh, in AWS in our instance. Uh, bin and user bin, well those contain binaries, uh, system binaries, commands. Bin is actually short for binary. User, USR is short for user. Uh, Sbin is our system administrator binary, system binaries, which makes sense. ETC, ETC is always a really funny one. Uh, Nowadays has all the most important files in the file system. All the services that we configure, all the sysadministration sys files, like, uh, like the password file, they're all in ETC. It originally stood for etc. When they were laying out the Linux file system, or the Unix file system, they had all these important files and they didn't know where to put them, so they just stuck them in, in the etc. directory. And it's one of the most important ones in the file system. I always found that pretty hilarious. Uh, var, short for variable, uh, 
uh, and that contains dynamic files, uh, variable in length, right? So log files, mail files, all exist within there. Temp, TMP, and var temp, those are temporary files for programs. Dev, that's uh, device driver files, so terminals, printers, every device that's in the system is, is represented in the file system somewhere uh, in dev. Now you're going to be working with directories and you're going to be working with files a bit in Linux. Uh, we're not going to be creating a whole lot directly from the command line, but you need a few things, right? Uh, as we're going to see. And before you learn to create directories, you have to understand uh, what represents an appropriate directory and file name. And a lot of the logic here applies to files that we create in web design as well, when we get to the more web development, website building aspect of this course. Uh, characters are case sensitive, and this is true across both, so you should always use lowercase characters. It's just a recommended best practice. You should adopt a consistent naming scheme. So this will help you better navigate your within your directory structure. Don't just throw everything in in one folder, right? Create subfolders and divide things up accordingly. Make your directory directory names meaningful, but also short. You don't want them to be super duper long. Short but descriptive. You should avoid using spaces completely for directory names. Uh, and for web design directories and files, I can't recommend this one enough. Just don't use them at all. It will make your life so much easier. Uh, Consider using a period or a hyphen or an underscore, or maybe just concatenate, right? Combine the two characters together. You should also avoid using non-alphanumeric characters because they might have special meaning to the system and they might make your life a lot more difficult when you're trying to change to it or, or work with that directory. So just, just flat out avoid them. Now, to manage directories, uh, there's a whole bunch of useful commands. Some of these that you're going to, well, all of these you're going to play around with this week, but some of them you're going to use time and time again in this course. mkdir uh, stands for make directory, and it's used to create directories within Linux. Uh, you can use the dash p option if you're creating a parent directory and a bunch of subdirectories, and it will create all of those at the same time. rmdir removes empty directories. Uh, they have to be empty. It will not remove a directory that has contents in it. If you want to remove a directory and its contents, or just straight up you remove a file, uh, you can use the rm command instead. rm-r will recursively remove uh, non-empty directories and their contents. And if you're doing that, you might want to use the dash i option, and that will prompt you for every uh, item that's deleting. Unless you're 100% sure and there's like a thousand things in there, then I would omit the I option because you don't want to say yes a thousand times. LS uh, is used to list contents. We actually talked about LS uh, briefly on one of the previous slides. And some common commands there are dash L, which will give you a detailed listing, or dash D, which will list the directory but not its contents, or dash R, which will give you a recursive uh, directory listing, so it will display the directory and their subdirectory's contents. Uh, and tree, uh, I mentioned already, will give you a, a, a tree diagram of the directory structure. Uh, CP will copy directories, and if you're copying a directory and its contents, then you want to include the dash uppercase R option, which will recursively copy everything. Uh, move, or uh, MV, will move directories uh, and their contents to a different directory. Now move is also used to rename directories and files, so that's a handy, super handy thing. I tend to use move a lot, especially when you make a mistake. Make a typo in a file name, don't, don't delete it, just move it. Uh, now, when you issue the, the ls command, uh, with the dash L option, you'll see a whole bunch of what looks like gibberish on the screen beside it. It's, it's not gibberish, it's information, you just don't understand what it means. Uh, that first field there, if it's a D, 
it indicates that it's a directory. If it's a dash, it's just a file. If it's a B or a C, it's a device. Uh, this string here is the file permissions that we're, we're not really going to get into in this course. Uh, and then we have, this is actually the number of contents within, the user that it belongs to, the group that they're in, the time and date stamp it was last modified, and then the name of the directory or file. Uh, now hidden files are a useful thing. You might be wondering, why bother making files hidden? Well, they could be useful to clean up your, your directory uh, structure a bit. If it's a file you're not going to be using that often, or maybe it's an important file and you want to make sure that it's not accidentally deleted and it's, it's hidden from just any what are you looking in. You can just you just put a dot in front of its file name and then it's hidden. It's pretty great. Uh, it's not going to appear when you issue the ls command, but if you issue ls with the dash a option, it's going to be hidden, including the uh, current directory and parent directory, which are represented uh, with dot for the current directory and dot dot for the parent directory. You can use these for navigating around in a very useful, handy way. Uh, if you issue ls with the uppercase A option, uh, it doesn't show the current and parent directory, but it shows the hidden files and non-hidden files, which is kind of weird. I don't know why you would want to use uppercase A. It's two less directories it shows, but it's an option. I tend to just use lowercase a. Uh, now something I've, I've usually mentioned at this point, but I'm, I haven't mentioned yet, and I'm going to mention it now. One of the useful things about Linux and the way it was designed is everything in Linux is a file. Everything is, is, is a file. And that means that text editors become very, very powerful tools. Uh, they allow you to create, modify, and save text files, which I just said, everything's a file, right? So configuration files, they're just text files. You just edit it with a text editor, you make your changes, you restart the service, and boom, you're up and running. Which is why we're learning all this nonsense, right? We're going to create an Apache web server next week. How do you think we're going to do that? You need to use some of this stuff. Uh, programming students use graphical IDEs to code, and we're actually going to be using one this semester. We're going to be using Visual Studio Code, which is great. Uh, but you could also just straight up use a text editor from the command line, which I don't recommend, uh, and compile their source code. Uh, it says their matrix account. Ignore that. I thought I thought I got uh, all the references to that out of here. Apparently I didn't. Uh, and you can compile your source code into an executable uh, program. So you could do this from the command line using a text editor. You could uh, just use a, an IDE as well. And we're going to use an IDE. We're going to use Visual Studio Code because it's awesome. I never thought I'd say awesome and Microsoft uh, product in the same sentence or same context, but I totally am. It's really well done. Uh, sysadmins, and this course is kind of it's balancing both, right? You're learning some sysadmin stuff, but you're also learning some uh, developer programmer stuff. It's kind of a mix of both now. But sysadmins, or system administrators, use text editors to edit configuration files. Programmers use them to create and edit source code and scripts. You're going to be doing both in this course. So it's very important for you to become familiar with the process of installing, configuring, and running uh, services on your server. And using a text editor to make configuration changes as needed, super duper important. That's, that's why we're doing all this stuff this week. Now when it comes to text editors within Linux, there's a bunch available, and you're going to expose them yourself to different ones and then find out which one you're most comfortable uh, using with. But the two that are most widely available and installed by default in every Linux operating system out there are Nano, and buy. There's graphical ones available as well, but uh, sometimes you've got access to a server, or in this case, an instance, right, in AWS, your Ubuntu instance, there is no GUI. So a graphical editor is going to do nothing for you, right? Uh, you're going to be using a very powerful graphical editor in, in Lab 4, that's Visual Studio Code, and we've talked about that, 
but the two most commonly available ones, Nano and Vi, very powerful, very useful, uh, and we're going to look at them both this week because you can use whichever one you need based on the context of what you're doing and what you're comfortable with. But you are going to be able, or are going to need to use at least one of them. So let's look at Nano first. Uh, Nano is a, a relatively easy to use text editor. Uh, you're automatically placed in input mode uh, when you launch the text editor from the command line and you can start entering text immediately. Uh, and Nano commands, there's, there's a list of commands at the bottom. Uh, they consist of a, a caret symbol which represents the control key followed by a character. A weird thing about Nano, there's no undo command, which is weird. You'd think there would be. Uh, and there's a table here that shows you the, uh, the different commands and their purpose in Nano, and you're going to look at them in this week's lab, so don't panic too much. You're going to play around with this a little bit. Uh, escape is represented uh, by the letter M sometimes, right? So to go forward or back with one wor word, just Control and Space or Escape and pa uh, Space respectively. Control A or Control E will take you to the beginning or the end of line. Control K will cut the line, escape and six will copy the line. Control U will paste uh, the text that you've either cut or copied. Control G gives you help on the screen. And when you, when you want to get out and save, just Control and X. It'll do both. It'll save and exit uh, editing immediately. Now, Nano is all well and good. And I use Nano quite a bit when I have to do something super quick. But if it's something a little more involved, and I only have access from the command line, I'll use Vim or Vi. Uh, so Vi, which is commonly Vim now, Vi improved, uh, it takes a lot longer to learn, but it's a very, very powerful text editor uh, and has some awesome features that can increase your coding, uh, coding productivity. One of the big differences between Nano and Vi is that Vi starts you in a command line mode. There's different modes that you have to switch between to do different things. Uh, you need to issue uh, different letter commands to perform different text editing uh, options, or press the colon, uh, shift and, and the semicolon, well, shift, shift, colon, right? I'm trying to say how to do it and it's not working too good. Uh, and that will bring you into last line mode. So you can issue more complex commands there. Now you can make it a little bit easier to learn, or to make it a little bit easier to learn, there's a tutorial that you can access. Uh, it's been around for a while. I can't take credit for creating it. I actually learned from it, uh, and I'm using it with permission. Uh, but it'll give you some hand, hands-on experience with the command line editing techniques. And to access this in your Ubuntu instance, uh, just issue a git clone, https double colon or colon slash slash github.com cnet204 vi tutorial. And uh, all of these these references or these uh, key combinations here are available in your week two uh, notes. Uh, there's a reference sheet. Now one of the other things you're going to want to do that we didn't do last week, and you might want to do, is shut down or reboot your instance. Uh, you don't necessarily have to worry about shutting it up down, because when you shut down the learner lab, that's taken care of automatically, but you might want to do it anyway. Sometimes, though, you might have to reboot. Uh, if, you apply, if you installed some updates and updated the kernel, usually you have to reboot. Uh, so you can do that with, you can shut down with either power off, one word, or shut down. Or you can reboot the instance with the reboot command, which could be useful. And of course, all of this maps to your lab two, uh, where you're going to use the instance that you created last week in lab one. And you're going to do all kinds of useful things in it. You're going to learn how to use the shell, how to access help from the command line, how to edit the command line and access your history, how to navigate the file system, create and manage directories, and use command line text editors, uh, Vi and Nano, the ones we were just talking about. And you're going to use all of these skills and learn some new ones too next week in Lab 3 when you learn how to create an Apache web server 
in AWS. And then we're going to use all of this infrastructure that we've built in the first three labs uh, and build a website with it. Uh, it's going to be really cool. We're going to have a lot of fun. On that note, take care, be safe, uh, and I will see you, or rather you'll see me, in the next video. Bye for now.